Hi, I'm Abby. I have a lot of records, and this is Vinyl Monday. So welcome back, or welcome if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the series where once a week I sit down and just talk about a classic album I love. If 20 minute episodes or however long this video is going to be, I don't even want to think about it, I have like 10 pages of notes. If those aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds, both here on my channel and over on my Instagram. Last week we concluded Mod Month May, four weeks where I just covered albums from the past 20 years, with Blue Rev by Always. But we can't go back to the 60s and 70s just yet. Our time machine is taking a little detour to celebrate this album's 30th birthday. If I had a nickel for every time I wore red velvet and matching lipstick while covering a 90s album, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it's happened twice. This week's album is... Souvlaki by Slow Dive. Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you want to play along, all you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where I post my hints to what album I'm gonna be covering next, plus other fun stuff. Before I dive into my specific pressing of this record, yes, the Suvlaki anniversary is in June. It was thought to be between May 15th and 17th for a long time. People kind of took this date and ran with it, but in reality, the Suvlaki release is pretty similar to what happened with Blonde on Blonde, in which nobody bothered to write the release date down. After some sleuthing, it was decided that Suvlaki was released on or around June 1st, 1993. We can't be 100% sure, but we do have some promotional material with the June 1st date on it. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's take the plastic off. So my copy is a reissue. This is the Music on Vinyl 180 gram reissue from I think 2011. I had to buy my copy off Discogs. If you're an American Slow Dive fan, then you know that Suvlaki and the rest of their albums are impossible to find in the wild over here. You UK and European fans are lucky bastards. The Suvlaki cover was photographed by Steve Double. I don't know much more about the photography or the photo shoot than that. I don't know where this was taken, but if the insert is any indication, my best guess would be that this photo was taken in either late 92 or early 93. Uh, seeing that there's no leaves on these trees, it looks like winter. I know I'm wearing my 90s whimsigoth realness for this video, but Looking at the photos from this shoot, these guys look like a band from the 60s. I mean, look how young they are. Look at all that hair. We have our track listing and liner notes on the reverse side of that insert. We also have the track listing on the back cover. As for the album title, apparently it comes from this bit that the Jerky Boys used to do. I don't know, I wasn't an adult in the 90s. I was born in the back half of 99. We have Neil Halstead in the center here. He's the lead vocalist, guitarist, and principal songwriter. All the way down in the corner is Rachel Goswell, also on vocals and guitar. Christian Seville on guitar. I think he's the one all the way in the back here. Nick Chaplin with all the hair on the side is on bass. And right up front, Simon Scott on drums. We have a very special guest on this record. Brian Eno plays keys on Sing and Here She Comes. Suvlaki was produced by Slow Dive with head engineer Ed Buller. Roll transition. <laughs> So it's the early 90s and British indie music is in a really weird place. If you don't know what shoegaze is, it's in the name. It's become kind of a meme to explain it at this point, so I won't. Just know that the name comes from the ungodly amount of equipment these musicians use to get that vacuum rock sound. What is the vacuum rock sound? This. 
That throne right there is the foundation of every shoegaze song ever. By 1993, grunge is established as the thing to do in rock music, but that's truer for here in the US than it ever was in the UK. Over there, Britpop was a much bigger deal, and it is about to explode in popularity at this time. Unlike their colleagues in the scene, UK shoegaze outfit Slowdive never really got the chance to be cool. Their first record, Just For A Day, received poor reviews upon release, and this embarrassed the hell out of them. So to set the scene for Zuvlaki, we already have a band with low morale. The foundation of Slow Dive had always been the boyfriend-girlfriend duo of Neil Halstead and Rachel Goswell. These two had been dating since they were 17 years old, so there is a lot of history there. Uh, this is a very productive dynamic for them. I mean, having your muse in your band is a dream come true on paper. That is, until you break up. Sometime in the spring of 1992, after five years together, Neil and Rachel break up. It seems it was triggered by the stress of touring, although I wouldn't be surprised if the stress of their debut record being totally shit on also contributed. If Suvlaki's writing is any indication, then this breakup was messy. Rachel insists that they kept the break outside of the band, though. They'd created this thing that was a lot bigger than them, so they wanted to preserve it by staying civil. Neil, on the other hand, he says this completely f***ed up the atmosphere of the band. Whoever side of the story you subscribe to, this split is the second big crack in Slow Dive's foundation. They all used to write their songs together, but with such a deep divide between the exes, it wouldn't be a long shot to guess that Neil started writing by himself to avoid Rachel. To nurse his wounds, Neil listens to a lot of what I can best describe as sad boy music. Think Joy Division, the Berlin Trilogy, Bowie's Lodger record as well. Brian Eno's work on the Berlin Trilogy brought a whole new batch of influences to the table. The pseudo-title track of this, Suvlaki Space Station, has Eno written all over it. Brian Eno is easily one of the most fascinating figures in modern music history. I would love to do an episode on him someday. Anyway... Neil calls him up in hopes of producing the Just For A Day follow-up. At first, he was like, Who is this random guy and why does he want me to produce his breakup record with his high school ex-girlfriend? But he eventually agreed to do some work with Slow Dive. Very hands-off, though. I'm not sure how this worked out. It's unclear. But I guess Neil was the only one to actually get to record with Brian. And Neil didn't know anything about his solo material, so poor guy is just in the studio talking Brian's ear off about the Bowie trilogy endlessly because he's totally been caught with his pants down. The final major influence on Suvlaki? Hash. Everyone was stoned out of their fucking minds. I honestly think that's the only way Neil and Rachel could bear to be around each other. While these sessions were productive, the Eno sessions gave the record Sing and Here She Comes, Neil was still visibly going through it. So Slow Dive's manager and label exec Alan McGee was like, okay, these vibes are rancid, send that guy on a vacation. So Neil fucks off to the country for a while, keeps writing on his own. Rachel uses these few weeks to take a break as well, leaving Nick and Christian to keep working by themselves. When Neil comes back from his sad boy cottage in Wales, he brings back a lot of material. Like, way too much. There were over 40 songs in the running for Suvlaki. Of this ludicrous amount of forlorn sh**, there are three songs that are especially personal. So much so that they are inextricable from the dynamic at hand. Machine Gun, 40 Days, and Dagger. Those three songs provide the framework for the rest of Suvlaki to be constructed around. It is here that Suvlaki is born. 
As strong of a pyramid as Machine Gun, 40 Days, and Dagger were, as immersive as Suvlaki Space Station was proving to be, and as helpful of compasses as Sing and Here She Comes were for exploring some broader horizons, the album was still missing something. Until Neil brings in one more song. As soon as the band starts working on When the Sun Hits, they all just fall in love with it. It becomes the darling of Suvlaki. This seems to be the song that brought everyone to some common ground after the dynamic had been shaken so hard. They have this shared Pixies vision for when the sun hits. Nick pushes that forward with a bass line that was inspired by Kim Deal. But when Alan heard the song, he pulls Neil aside for the heroin talk. Imagine writing a song so good that your management just assumes you're on hard drugs. Incredible. Slow Dive tries handing in Suvlaki a second time. They get rejected again. So a couple months ago, I said that a band producing their own record could go one of two ways. Either it is a stroke of genius, or it's kind of a disaster. As dedicated of musicians as Slow Dive were, were they really producers? Eh, their idea of production was turning all of the faders up to 11 and just leaving them there. Enter Ed Buller. He mixed Suvlaki and, in my eyes, is the hero of this project. To give Suvlaki some semblance of commercial appeal and to preserve at least a little bit of his sanity, Ed pairs back every single track. If this is the record after Ed got a hold of it, I can't imagine what it was like before. Bless this man, he should be sainted for his patience. Some of this stuff was mixed live for Suvlaki Space Station, Simon, Neil, and engineer Chris Hufford each took a spot on the mixing board and they were ping-ponging the delay back and forth from each other. Now, while maximalism was Ed's issue, Minimalism was Simon's. During all of the hullabaloo during the Brian Eno sessions, uh, no one had bothered to include a click track on any of the songs. So poor Simon is struggling through Sing. That tempo just kind of oscillates back and forth and he was losing his mind. After six months of this aimless noodling and damage control, the Courtyard Sessions finally pull Suvlaki into some semblance of a finished product. It's handed into creation a third time, and, well, the third time was the charm. They finally accepted it as an album. That final track listing of Suvlaki goes as follows. <laughs> Opening up side one, we have Allison, followed by Machine Gun. Next, 40 Days, then Sing, and side one closes with Here She Comes. Opening up side two, we have Suvlaki Space Station, followed by When the Sun Hits, then All Together, next Melon Yellow, and the album closes with Dagger. Suvlaki was released on or around June 1st, 1993, 30 years ago this week. Only one single was put out, Allison. If an article in Melody Maker is proof, then it was actually put out on the week of May 15th. I think that's where people are getting the May date from. Speaking of Melody Maker, this thing got slaughtered upon release. With such illustrious moments as calling the singing mumbling, the record dull, and the band foot fetishists? Melody Maker's review concluded with the following. This record is a soulless void, devoid of pain, anger, feeling, or concern. Aside from sing, I would rather drown choking in a bath full of porridge than ever listen to it again. Slow dive? More like slow death. For the life of me, I cannot wrap my head around why Dave Simpson's review of Suvlaki 
was so unnecessarily mean. This is actually the summation of everything I hate about music criticism, I'm sorry. NME was a little nicer. John Mulvey praised Slow Dive for taking some risks, but still concluded Suvlaki was pretty but unfulfilling. There's exactly one nice review from this time. Ian Giddens, also from Melody Maker, ranked Allison as his number two single for the week of May 15th, 1993. It's hard to imagine now, but in the 90s, when all a music listener had to go by were the print reviews, they held a lot of power. One music critic has one bad day, choose to take it out on your album that you poured so much of your heart and soul into, and that's it. It's over. You're done. And that's exactly what happened to Slow Dive. This Melody Maker review proved to be the very quick death of Slow Dive. Critics piled on Suvlaki even harder than they had for just for a day. Reception was so bloody, it rendered the follow-up Pygmalion dead in the water. That record only sold about 100 copies upon release. Slow Dive was dropped from creation the week after that, and they disbanded shortly after. They would partially regroup as Mojave 3, but that's a story for another day. So why did this happen? Why was Suvlaki the critical punching bag of 1993? If there's one thing to know about UK music press in the 90s, it's that it was vicious. They built groups up and tore them back down again with such voracity. It's kind of appalling to look back on today. Perhaps the best example of this phenomenon is Shoegaze. MBV's Loveless considered the defining statement of Shoegaze. It's also one of the few Shoegaze records that the music press gave positive reviews to upon release. Which meant that Loveless was also the record that killed shoegaze in the eyes of music critics. The genre was always an easy target, right? There's a bunch of dorks making that music. The idea was you're not better than Loveless, you'll never be better than Loveless, so why bother? This circle of writers was also obsessed with elevating the next big thing. By the mid-90s, critics were so far up Britpop's ass that they rejected anything and everything else as outdated gunk. Ugh, I love having things to blame on the Gallagher brothers. If grunge was suddenly uncool now, imagine what shoegaze was. If you gave them a positive review, you might have been laughed out of the business. To publicly praise a group like Slow Dive would be social suicide. As much of a bloodbath as Suvlaki Reception was, and how obliquely it could be considered the album that broke Slow Dive, uh, they seem to have pretty fond memories of making it. When the Sun Hits is Rachel's favorite song they ever did. Sometime around 2005, online music circles, <laughs> 4chan, rediscover these 90s gems that went unappreciated in their time. The big one was, of course, in the aeroplane over the sea, but Suvlaki was in this bunch of albums too. And now, retrospective views on Suvlaki couldn't be any different than upon release. This is hailed as being one of the defining shoegaze records, along with Loveless. So, what do I think of Suvlaki? <laughs> Through Dave Simpson's review, it's evident that he made very little effort to engage with Suvlaki at all. To call it devoid of any feeling, especially anger or pain, is baffling. Suvlaki was authored by feeling, so much so that you have to rely on feeling to experience it. It's in the music and it's in the lyrics. Dave committed a cardinal sin of talking about music. He was unfeeling. Basically, this guy has a tuna casserole where his soul should be. I'm warning you now, a lot of critique of Suvlaki revolves around feeling. I don't know how not to feel this album. As a person who talks about music, it's my duty to inform you when I can't be objective about something I'm hearing, whether it's soundtracked huge parts of my life, 
Or if I have a big fat crush on one of the band members. So going in, I have a lot of history with this record. This, along with Joni Mitchell's Blue, right here, uh, they were the soundtrack of the worst breakup I've ever been through. This was back in 2019. I had just turned 20 that week. It well and truly sucked. If it hadn't been for that ex breaking my heart so acutely and so abruptly, I wouldn't have had to listen to a different album every day to distract myself. And this channel wouldn't be here. Suvlaki was also the record that solidified my bond with my best friend in the whole world, Jack. A lot of the historical context for this episode came from him. He's my invaluable across the pond resource. He knows everything and anything there is to know about Suvlaki. Jack told me, do it for Rachel! Just pretend that was in an Irish accent. I can't do one myself. But I don't have the decade-long attachment to slow dive lore that he does. Instead, I'm doing it for Jack. You kind of have to focus on the feel of Suvlaki since the vocals on half of these songs are totally swamped. But that's just how you made a shoegaze record in the 90s. You're forgiven for mistaking some vocals as wacky guitar effects. I did for the longest time with this excerpt from Allison. If you want the most complete experience of Suvlaki, you have to sit down with a lyrics sheet in front of you. That's the only way you're going to be able to decipher this stuff, because I promise you will hear something and then read something totally different. Case in point, machine gun. The phrase machine gun isn't said at all in the song. The line is actually son of Shiva. But to get the fullest experience of Suvlaki, you just have to dive in heart first. No lyrics, no preconceived notions about what rock music should sound like. You just have to go. 30 years on, Suvlaki is in the canon of the greatest breakup albums ever written. It's in leagues with Blood on the Tracks, with Blue, and with, you know, <laughs> But is it really a breakup if you never had her because she was married to your best friend? Of this canon, Suvlaki is most comparable to Rumors. Oh, I was dreading the day this record would finally come up in a vinyl Monday. Um, I'm gonna break hundreds of hearts by admitting that I'm not much of a fan of Rumors. Setting my feelings about this aside, the Fleetwood Mac comparisons do have the facts to back them up. Neil and Rachel were the 90s Buckingham Knicks. They relentlessly wrote about each other on this thing, and while their breakup didn't break the band, it sure did help the process along. As we saw in the last section, it was really the press that broke Slow Dive. What I can say about the technical stuff is that Suvlaki is a feat of modern production. Dave Simpson was wrong. This album isn't cold or bland. It's textured, and those textures are so varied. The sharp and the clear, that bass drum and those blasts of air in Suvlaki Space Station, moments like that, you can really hear where Suvlaki picked bits and pieces up from Joy Division. You have those organic elements versus layers of overdrive, fuzz, reverb, loops, waterfalls of sound that you get on Allison, 40 days when the sun hits. Overall, the textures on Suvlaki are quite watery, those waterfalls of sound, and then there's Sing. Sing has this slinky, slithering sound, like the glittering surface of water. If there's any thread that unites all of Suvlaki, it's this watery soundscape. If there's another, it's the struggle to unlove someone. Suvlaki starts with the OG Manic Pixie Dream Girl anthem, Allison. The narrator's object of affection is a fickle, flighty mess who might not even be real, 
but damn does he love her anyway. Quotes like TV covered walls, I'll wear your clothes when we're both high, pleading to this girl saying we're sinking. These vignettes are wild and tragic and beautiful. And I still wish this song was about me. Okay, like 40 year old Neil is seeming cute all of a sudden. Oh God, it's the tooth gap. Ah! 40 Days has my favorite lyrics on the record. If I saw something new, I guess I wouldn't worry. If I saw something new, I guess I wouldn't care. I do have to say, I'm so high that I lost my mind gave me a chuckle. This is really a picture of a breakup so bad you have to be zooted beyond this mortal plane to be around each other. Maybe being zooted beyond this mortal plane would have helped when I ran into him in the courtyard and then bawled my eyes out in my college roommate's arms in the parking lot of a Dairy Queen anyway. For a long time, Sing made me think that there were two female vocalists in Slow Dive and that this was like a huge band. But no, I'm dumb. It's just the layering of Rachel's vocals and it really works. This song and that bit from Allison are some really creative manipulations of vocal tracks. Suvlaki Space Station. 19 year old me was wrong about this song. I used to skip this one because I thought it was boring. But now that I'm older and I've been writing about music for a while now, and I know and care about production, I recognize Suvlaki Space Station as the crown jewel of Suvlaki production. The live mixing, sending that delay back and forth is so cool. This is one of those moments where I actually don't hate stereo panning. Here, we're about 20 feet deep and caught in a riptide. You can't find the bottom of great shoegaze stuff. I mentioned that last week with Blue Rev. Once you're in Suvlaki Space Station, your feet can't touch the bottom. Put headphones on and it gets straight up disorienting. You might want the lyrics sheet for this one though. Uh, you'll find that Rachel is singing the most scathing stuff on the record. Curse your soul, I don't wanna know you. This is so special because through the other 34 minutes of Suvlaki, we are hearing all about what Neil has to say, what Neil thinks, what Neil feels. Suvlaki Space Station, for about six minutes, it's how Rachel feels. This girl is real, and she's angry. When the sun hits is the torch carrying this album forward. It's their greatest hit, and it's the vehicle that brought this album to so many listeners, including me. When the sun hits stumbled into my Spotify when I was about 19, and I fell in love with it instantly. This is one of my favorite songs that has ever been recorded. You crack my heart open and pour out its contents. It sounds like when the sun hits. It's tension and release, it's push and pull is so strong you can feel it in your chest. This is how you use wacky alternate guitar tunings. And once again, we have that theme established in Allison of an unstable romance between two unstable people. I watch you burn so fast it scares me. I gotta say, Rachel, Neil, if this is your idea of the happy song on the album, Yikes. If that noise machine or whatever it is at the end of Suvlaki Space Station is the calm before the storm, then all together is that uncomfortable stillness after the devastation that has occurred. Bringing Fleetwood Mac into the fray all together is the anti the chain. It feels like a funeral march with those sluggish hand claps. For better or for worse, we're all in this together. Does Melon Yellow really have to be here? Uh, I think it messes with the pacing of side two. Boom. I'm reapplying my lipstick in the viewfinder that I don't have. Suvlaki ends with the most organic song, Dagger. These are the most devastating and intimate lyrics we get from Neil. Rachel's are very shrouded in effects. Neil's are more up and center, up front and center. Can you tell it's been a long time of me sitting here? He confesses how deeply he's hurt the woman sleeping next to him. The sunshine girl is sleeping, she falls and dreams alone, and me, I am her dagger. Partway through, the narrator shifts from addressing an ambiguous someone, a fantasy person that doesn't exist, 
to the real girl. Am I outing myself as insufferable if I say that Zivlaki ends exactly the same way as Pinkerton by Weezer does? Oh god, you all better prepare yourselves for September of 2026 when I am 27 years old and I will have waited eight years to rant and rave about fucking Pinkerton. Zivlaki Space Station and Dagger are the root of Zivlaki. Two people who, it seems, were born to hurt each other. And they were so young. You have to remember that this record is about the end of a high school slash college age romance. Can you imagine if you had something like this thing, immortalizing your high school boyfriend, girlfriend, romantic partner, whatever, I would die. As essential as Neil and Rachel's contributions are to Suvlaki, I feel as though Nick's contributions are overlooked. Lots of slow dives influences for this one, namely Joy Division and the Pixies. They're very bass forward. Suvlaki Space Station and When the Sun Hits clearly harken back to that. Last week, I hearkened Blue Rev to a scar on your knee when you got as a kid. Suvlaki is an open wound. It's a monument to a love that, if these narrators are to be believed, was doomed from the start. These moments are brilliant and bright while also being dark and bottomless all at once. It's intricate and one of those bodies of work that reaches out and grows its vines around you. Whether you're living it, a grouchy critic trying to disengage from it, or a young person discovering it three decades on and finding it's your life raft, this album gets a reaction out of you. It's impossible not to feel Suvlaki. My personal favorites on this one are Allison, Machine Gun, 40 Days, Suvlaki Space Station, and When the Sun Hits. If you want to keep up with all of my favorites from all the Vinyl Mondays, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. And that is it. That is Suvlaki by Slow Dive 30 years later. What do you think of this album? What do you think of this band? If you remember the release of this thing, what did you think of it then? And how do you feel about it now? Let me know in the comments. I love hearing what you guys have to say about albums I love. And if you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next week. Bye.